surprised how much sound you can get, you know. Uh, you know, you're never aware of it if you're, you know, just going for a walk. And, you know. It is called uh, Quiet Reckonings of Many Species and Objects. And so it's kind of, it's about that interconnectivity of, of elements. It was kind of produced and researched over a five month period, um, part of the uh, Mary Manson Virtual uh, Artist Residency. Um, and as well, uh, jumping into regular conversations with uh, this young elder, uh, Louis Thomas. Um, and so you'll hear his voice and my voice in the piece, um, very similar to like our, our check-ins and like uh, chats that we had throughout. One of the first things he, I asked him, and one of the first things he said to me was, I, I asked him what settlers uh, could do to more positively uh, relate to, uh, to plants and to animals, to, to non-human beings and non-beings on stolen land. His response was to listen. Uh, to the plants, to the plants, to the plants, to the animals. Um, and he told me about things that the plants have told him, and I thought that was quite, uh, quite interesting. So I decided to take on this practice um, and and try that out in San Bernard, try that out in, in Kelowna, um, on unceded silks and cyclopic territory. I started noticing all the bugs, all the all the tiny worlds that existed. And my work being quite a bit about hybridity, I decided to bring in some elements of of like rubber and plastic um, materials that you consider artificial um, and combine them with materials that you would consider uh, natural. But if you listen closely to kind of our conversation, uh, you'll realize that it's a lot about kind of the false boundaries of what's human and what's nature and kind of this false category. Uh, and what exists instead is like this, this more intricate um, and interconnected mesh uh, that we call ecology. About a year ago, during the COVID lockdown, I spent a lot of time walking in the hills behind our house. There were a lot of cattle up there spending all of their time eating and being curious about anybody who came into their territory. Sometimes they would walk towards you very quickly in a big herd that looked like they had a lot of hooves on them that could trample you. So I figured I should get started on a big art project as I had a lot of materials in my backyard. I had a number of these very large pipes that were really good for conducting sound and distorting that sound as it moved through the course of it. I had a lot of distractions that summer, such as building this recumbent tricycle out of wood. When I was young, I had this gramophone, but it didn't have a horn, and I became a little bit obsessed with some time in my life building a gramophone horn. So for a project a few years ago, I built three of them, although these were for sound collecting rather than sound amplification. I've used them in a number of different projects ever since. For the last project, I built a number of these large, strangely shaped speaker boxes the function of which was to distort sound as it moved through it. I also had three of these white plastic barrels that were used as containers for rubbing alcohol, so I thought they would make good sound mixers. During that time, we had deer sleeping in our yard near that newly planted tree. There were also a lot of bees in the various shrubs. <laughs> So I thought it might be good to create some music for those cows for the short time here on Earth. To make a wind instrument large enough to communicate with all those cows up in the hills, I had to assemble all of the parts into some sort of coherent structure that would be useful for creating and collecting sound on a mass scale. So I pointed those speakers toward the hills and started inserting the pipes into the speaker boxes and then adding more elements to make the sound possibilities more complex. This was to be a wind instrument very similar to the function of a didgeridoo. I thought it might be interesting if I could play the entire instrument just from one position, um, sending the sound through all of those different pipes. 
So I spent a lot of time acquiring lots of PVC pipe and connecting it all together so it funneled down to one particular point from which I could sit in one place and play it. And then winter came and I had to pack everything up for the year. The cattle were all gone off to the next chapter in their life. And we had the winter winds creating their own symphony of different sounds. Winter can be quite beautiful here, so I was still inspired to walk up in the hills and think about different sounds that the landscape offered. Summer came around with a new crop of cattle. Although they were still not that interested in communicating with me. So I put everything back together again and added a number of new elements to it. I decided to send a proposal into the gallery since there was an opening in the exhibition and I was offered a wall to place my work and came up with a preliminary idea that may or may not work. With all of the parts more or less assembled, it was time to start practicing. I decided on a new format and a mechanism based on the sounds of crickets chirping. I tested to see if that nice modern furniture was comfortable and if all the measurements would fit the space. Realized that the barrel had to go upright and to switch it around in the opposite direction. Everything seemed to fit and then came the hard part. Finishing the sound mechanisms and most importantly making sure that they worked. So here it is, it all works okay except for the part in the lower box that is so subtle and quiet that you can't actually hear it. And it's fairly aptly named because the main motive force behind this is magnetism. So the red coil on here is actually an electromagnet that turns on and off, uh, controlled by a little small computer basically. And what it does is it attracts a magnet at the base up towards that coil and then it turns off and allows the magnet to continue uh, upwards towards the top of the tube to strike one of the bars to play the notes and make the melodies. I came up with the concept probably over two years ago. Essentially it was I wanted to see if I could take a traditional instrument recreated in a different way that uses sort of invisible forces or an unconventional method to make that happen. I built a, a CNC rotor a few years ago and so all of the wooden parts have, I uh, programmed, I created a digital model and then a lot of the parts on here are also 3D printed, the little plastic ones. So I have a small 3D printer as well. To figure out the amount of turns of magnet wire I needed on there, I wound 10 different tubes and applied voltage and see how well they worked different amounts of magnets at the base. Uh, ultimately, the amount of wire I needed was from the device in my garage to the pedestrian white line in the street outside my house and back again. <laughs> so basically, the toggle switches allow you to choose one of eight different pre-programmed melodies. Um, they're they're sort of, they work uh, based on a binary number system where every switch when it's in an up position is assigned a value and the value of all the up switches gets added together to choose the number of the melody. So I'm just going to start with possibly my favorite, but a very simple one. So it's just a C major scale, quickly ascending and slows down on the descent. By holding down the low C and the high C button momentarily, you can go into a manual mode. It allows you to play it like a traditional keyboard or a piano. Once you hit the, that combination again, it goes back into the automatic mode. And you can choose a different melody. So, inside this box, 
is uh, a Raspberry Pi computer, so it's just a tiny little computer, it's kind of about this size, and I had to teach myself how to do some programming. <laughs> there are 15 different sounds um, that are triggered that relate to a poem that I wrote called The Feels. There's a longer soundtrack that runs through the whole of the piece, and um, that's actually Morse code of the poem. So there's a little camera in there, and it, don't worry, it's not recording anyone. Yeah. <laughs> but if you imagine a TV screen, there are 15 little dots that are on that screen. And as somebody moves across, each of those little dots will trigger a different sound, but they actually all trigger at different times. I can actually log in to here, and I can update it from, from home. So you might come back and it might actually be completely different. White. White. My other piece, uh, this was a collaboration with uh, Tracy and Jerry Matthew. Um, so originally, Tracy sort of had an idea of something she'd like to see and they didn't have the technical know-how to get it done, so she asked if I would be able to accomplish this task, which was basically to hook up an MP3 player inside a phone and have it play through the earpiece. I thought, okay, that's kind of cool, but what if we took it to maybe like the next level and got some more interactivity with it? So my concept was, well, we've got this phone and maybe we can dial a number and actually hear different or discrete voices or recordings. So, um, so Jerry Matthew sat down with Tracy and recorded a bunch of the different phrases and I turned it into individual tracks that could be triggered when you dial uh, a single number on the phone. So it basically says it's a couple of phrases. Um, that are standard readings for us. So it's a, it's a way to go up and learn and uh, hear the words and see them written. My piece is called Chance Encounters for Prepared to Turntable. And so what is a prepared turntable? So I, um, I'm inspired by the American composer John Cage who invented the prepared piano. What he did, uh, was that he took screws and crystals and rocks and objects and wedged them in between the strings of a piano, basically turned it into a, a, a new instrument. So I chose the turntable to prepare. And the reason why I like the turntable, it unites our auditory and um, visual perspectives and they become one. So we're actually seeing what's causing the music. This is uh, a turntable that I'm using as an instrument. I'm an instrumentalist, I'm a pianist, and I wanted to explore how I could write um, a little poem as a musical score that invited people to play this instrument. So I'd like to read the score to you now, and it's see and hear the suspended stones random dance across the surface while taking turns holding the bow with or without a partner. I wanted to explore how to arrange the stone so that it didn't create the steady beat of traditional music, so that any time you played this, the pattern that it would create would be completely random each time and never the same. So Lucas and I were fortunate enough to be able to, because of COVID, participate for approximately five months where we would meet um, weekly or bi-weekly with the gallery staff and with Louis Thomas which culminated in, in participating in the sound machines show. I was inspired by the gulls after hearing Louis. I got to spend a lot of time with our local uh, gull population. I was inspired to do this kind of more experimental sound sculpture I guess um, involving kind of our plants and animal kin with like weaving that through how our, our human uh, ways <laughs> interact with those things. I was looking for a way to kind of ground the piece. The um, sound mechanisms and speakers exist within the <laughs> containers. It was fun to kind of figure out how to hide the sounds of the, the wrinkles and sort of um, allow them to exist within the sculpture with sound but not existing.